only Washington's buildings and culture that were immeasurably influenced by Greece, but also the city's main business, democratic politics, were founded in Athens as well. In fact, to be brutally frank, we all owe our jobs to our noble ancestors. But I come here, uh, Madam Speaker, Madam Vice President, not to seek appreciation from you or praise for them. I come uh, before you to celebrate a miracle that all free peoples cherish, but that binds Greeks and Americans in a unique way. That miracle, the Greek idea that would forever change the world, is that society functions best if all its citizens are equal and have the right to share in running their state. In a word, democracy, demokratia. It is, it is very, very hard for us to realize how radical this idea of individual freedom of self-governance was 25 centuries ago when a small community of Greeks dared to entrust equal political and legal rights to all its citizens. Women and slaves were excluded, but it was still such an extraordinary departure from what had gone before it that I believe it remains the most profound leap of faith in human history. No society, no society before the Greeks dared to believe that order and freedom were compatible. All societies before them were a succession of tyrannies that relied on a strong leader, a king, a pharaoh, an emperor to keep them functioning. And this lesson was not lost on the founders of the United States who shaped their constitution, the American constitution, on the Athenian model, but were wise enough to insert checks and balances to avoid the excesses that eventually undermined Athenian democracy. The birth of... Uh, <laughs> the birth of uh, democracy in ancient Athens brought about an explosion of the creative spirit in Greece that produced the architecture, the art, the drama, the philosophy that have shaped Western civilization ever since. The establishment of democracy in the United States has brought about the greatest expansion of human freedom and human progress the world has ever known. Ladies and gentlemen, last year, Greece uh, celebrated 200 years since the beginning of our War of Independence. And in a very strange but interesting twist of historical fate, it was the Greek people who were inspired by the foundation of American democracy when they rose against their oppressor to fight for their own freedom. What Americans, what you, had shown us by example, is that liberty can actually be fought for and even against the odds won. We understood the founding of your republic to be a watershed in the history of the world, a model for the oppressed nations of Europe, a hope for our own future. Right from the start, therefore, our forefathers looked across the Atlantic for support. From the distant Peloponnese, the leaders of the Greek Revolution sent an appeal in the spring of 1821 to the American people, their friends, their fellow citizens, and brethren. They spoke of the natural sympathy the Greeks felt for Americans, the thirst for freedom, that they had both derived from the Asians. They wrote at the time, in imitating you, we imitate our own ancestors. We shall show ourselves 
worthy of them in proportion as we resemble you. The founding fathers of your republic were moved and impressed. Light and liberty are in steady advance, wrote Thomas Jefferson on learning of the news from Greece. The flames kindled on July 4th, 1776, have spread over too much of the globe to be extinguished by the feeble engines of despotism. Exactly 200 years ago, in 1822, revolutionary Greeks assembled at Epidavros, debated, and we drew up our first constitution. And with this document, we introduced in the newly liberated Greek lands a new language of rights. Above all, the right of a nation to throw off the shackles of tyranny in order to rule, to live under the rule of law. In the words of our Declaration of Independence, have we something lesser than other nations that we remain deprived of these rights? Or are we of a nature lower or less civilized than we should view ourselves as unworthy to enjoy them and instead be condemned to an eternal slavery, subjected like automats or beasts of burden to the absurd caprices of a cruel tyrant? These are rights which within Greece we have never ceased to defend by arms when times and circumstances have permitted. A shocking reality. Replace the word Greece with Ukraine and the similarities to today's turbulent world are harrowing. Two years uh, later, in a little town in Western Greece called Mesolongi, these exact words were published alongside a translation of the American Constitution. That book was one of the first ever books printed on Greek soil. It stands testimony to the immense values we Greeks attached from the start of our own future as a liberal and constitutional polity. That this little book appeared at the height of the war was remarkable. That it was printed in Mesologi was simply incredible. Like Mariupol today, Mesologi's outnumbered and emaciated defenders would repeatedly repel wave upon wave of enemy attacks before their final desperate sortie, an act of extraordinary daring, but one that would ultimately cost hundreds of lives, many of whom were women and children. When we see the same suffering among the outnumbered defenders of Mariupol, a city with a Greek name and deep Greek roots we are reminded of Mesolongi and the cost of our own struggle. <laughs> Even today, we have not forgotten the American volunteers who sailed to fight alongside us. Some of them gave their lives for our freedom. Their names are honored and their graves are still cared for. Nor have we forgotten others of your countrymen who mounted what must have been one of the first humanitarian efforts in history by sending Greece aid and assistance. Remarkable figures, like Samuel Gridley Howe, cared for women and children who had been left homeless and destitute and established hospitals, schools, and orphanages that supported us in the difficult years that followed. The first school for girls, Madam Speaker, Madam Vice President in Greece, was founded in Athens in 1831 by an American pastor, John Hill. The Hill Memorial School still continues to, Greek, to teach Greek children today in the historic center of Athens. And this long arc of American philanthropy continued throughout the 19th century, spreading across the Near and Middle East. And in times 
of dire need in the following decades, most notably a century ago, when hundreds of thousands of refugees streamed into Greece from Asia Minor following the catastrophic aftermath of the First World War, American institutions were there to bring aid and relief. And of course, we should not forget it was the Marshall Plan that helped my country rebuild its infrastructure after the devastating Second World War and the civil war that ensued. And in its own way, Greece reciprocated. Among uh, the Greek orphans who were brought across the Atlantic into the United States to escape the fighting after 1821 were a future congressman and a commander in the US Navy. Young Greeks saved from the war became American educators and writers. Many of them were dedicated abolitionists for the eradication of slavery was a cause whose urgent necessity spoke directly to men and women who had once been enslaved themselves. And over the past two centuries, our two countries have always been on the right side of history. We fought side by side in world wars to defend freedom and democracy. Our democracies have struggled with internal demons. We, both our countries, endured the horrific pains of civil wars, the desperation of economic crisis. But we have emerged stronger and more committed to defend the values that our ancestors gave their lives for. Esteemed members of Congress, I began today by saying that uh, this bicentennial is more than a moment of celebration. It is also a reminder of the values that bind us together, but also the tasks that we still face. The world has changed a good deal in recent months, but the warning signs have been with us for decades. Following the end of the Cold War, we naively believed that Europe, which had twice driven the world into global conflict, had finally found the path to peace. We believe that international cooperation and a shared commitment to the rule of law now prevailed over guns and armies. We believe that the deepening of the European Union, a unique experiment in the history of the world, designed to further link our countries together would make war on the dark continent unthinkable. And we believed that given the tragic, the harrowing experiences of the 20th century, no one, no one would ever venture to suppress another people's right to exist or alter its borders by force. We naively ignored the warning signs, flashing red. And we even ignored Russia's actions in Syria and its annexation of Crimea. We now know that we were wrong. Today, like all of you, we Greeks look at what is happening just 500 miles to our north, and we are horrified and appalled. We look to Kiev, we look to Odessa, the city where our revolution was first conceived. We look at the tragedy unfolding in Western Ukraine. Mariupol was a city founded by Catherine the Great in 1778 to resettle Greeks from Crimea who were fleeing Ottoman rule. And what we see is once more a, is a people who are faced with the necessity of fighting to defend themselves in order to secure their future and their freedom. Let me be very clear. We have no animus towards the Russian people with whom we have been bound so closely by faith and history. But we cannot, we simply cannot be indifferent to a struggle that reminds us so much of our own.
we too know. We too know what it is to be forced to reckon with invasion, to stand up for one's beliefs, and to have to resort to arms to protect our liberty. We know something about the heroism of the underdog, for whom the first victory comes from not capitulating in the face of overwhelming odds, from simply hanging on. <laughs> from simply hanging on and praying that others will come to our aid. And we too understand the importance of friends. We understand the power of allies in the defense of the values that we share. Without allies, the Greeks would not, for all their heroism, have been able to win their independence. And that is why we recognize the importance of taking sides now. And we took sides unequivocally. We stand by Ukraine against Putin's aggression. We delivered humanitarian aid. We supported the Ukrainians with weapons to help them defend their homeland. And we have welcomed, we have welcomed with open arms, refugees who have fled Ukraine in search of safety for themselves and their families. Mr. Putin is striving to create a world in which power is for the strong state, but not the small a world where territorial claims are made on the basis of historical fantasies and enforced by aggression rather than decided by peace treaties, a world in which armies rather than diplomats settle disputes. He will not succeed. He must not succeed. And he must not succeed, not only for the sake of Ukraine, but also in order to send a message, in order to send a message to all other authoritarian leaders that historical revisionism and open acts of aggression that violate international law will not be tolerated by the global community of democratic states. This language of resentment, of uh, revisionism, of imperial nostalgia, this language cannot prevail. And speaking of open acts of aggression, I ask you, esteemed members of Congress, not to forget an open wound that has caused Hellenism unending pain over the past 48 years. I'm referring to the invasion and subsequent division of Cyprus. The, this issue has to be resolved in accordance with international law and in line with the relevant decisions of the United Nations Security Council. As I told President Biden yesterday, nobody can, nobody ever will accept a two-state solution in Cyprus. And the same is true, Madam Speaker, of all other regional disputes. Greece is a peace-seeking democracy that always extends 
a hand of friendship to our neighbors. We're always open to dialogue. But there is only one framework we can use to resolve our differences. International law and the unwritten principles of good neighborly relations. And I want to be absolutely clear. We will not accept open acts of aggression that violate our sovereignty and our territorial rights. And these include overflights over Greek islands, which must stop immediately. Please also note, the last thing, the last thing that NATO needs at a time when our focus is on helping Ukraine defeat Russia's aggression is another source of instability on NATO's southeastern flank. And I ask you to take this into account when you make defense procurement decisions concerning the eastern Mediterranean. The United States has, I believe, vital interests in this part of the world. It is very important that you remain engaged and work with partners with whom you share not only common strategic priorities, but also shared values and a shared history. Ladies and gentlemen, last Thursday, the Hellenic Parliament ratified the new mutual defense and cooperation agreement between our two countries. Whereas previously it was renewed uh, annually by an act of parliament, now it has a five-year duration after which it is automatically renewed unless one of the parties chooses not to do so. This agreement is a powerful testament of our enduring strategic partnership and our commitment to maintain peace and prosperity in the Eastern Mediterranean. And nowhere is that more obvious than in Suda Bay, which I know many of you have visited. It is the largest naval base in the Eastern Mediterranean, the only port that can accommodate aircraft carriers. But it is also obvious in the city of Alexandropolis, in northeastern Greece, which is rapidly becoming an energy hub for the entire region. This is important. It's important as we seek to rapidly diversify away from Russian gas, investing in the necessary infrastructure that will make it possible to import large quantities of liquefied natural gas. This becomes critical, not just for Greece, but also for our Balkan neighbors. We plan to interconnect. I should tell my colleagues, I don't get that much applause in the Greek parliament. So. <laughs> we plan to, to interconnect the Greek electricity grids with Cyprus, with Israel, but also with Egypt. The purpose is to be able to import cheap, renewable energy from the Middle East and Africa into the European electricity systems. But this thriving partnership between our two countries is not just limited to uh, security and energy. Pfizer has set up a big data analytics center in Thessaloniki. Microsoft is building state-of-the-art data centers outside Athens. JP Morgan has invested in one of the leading Greek fintech companies. I believe that what American companies see today in Greece is not just a country endowed with an advantageous geographical position and blessed with a natural beauty that makes it a magnet for visitors from all, all over the world. What they also see is a dynamic economy 
that has overcome the difficulties, the pathogenies of the past, and is supporting entrepreneurship and private investment. And what they see, which is probably the most important aspect of all, is a young, talented, well-educated workforce. These young, talented, well-educated Greeks who, after a decade of crisis, choose to remain in their homeland rather than emigrating. Or for those who had actually left the country, choose to return to Greece now. And I'm convinced they will be the protagonists of Greece's bright future. Esteemed uh, members of Congress, I have spoken about the joint paths that our two great democracies have chartered over the past two centuries. We have every reason today to celebrate our achievements, but it would be foolish to remain complacent. The United States has a crucial role to play today in an even more complicated world, from addressing climate change to standing up against authoritarian regimes, from countering fake news and disinformation to preparing for the next pandemic, the world looks to the strongest and most prosperous democracy for leadership. You simply cannot afford to sit on the sidelines. Multilateralism, in my mind, is not an option. It's a necessity, not only for a more stable world order, but also for your own self-interest. But we must also need to put our own house in order. Personally, I am more worried about the internal fragmentations of our democracies than I fear the threat of arrogant despots. We frequently remember the words of President Ronald Reagan, freedom is never more than a generation away from extinction. But let us not... <laughs> let us not forget that Abraham Lincoln referred to the unfinished business of democracy. And unfinished it is indeed. Our democracies are threatened by the sirens of populists who offer easy solutions to complicated problems. Their voices are being heard, primarily because income inequality has increased in our societies, and many justifiably feel that they are left behind. In Greece, we speak from experience. We pay the heavy price for listening to them. Everywhere, in the world, in the United States, in Greece, in Europe, social media is polarizing public debate. It is transforming the public sphere into a modern day version of the Tower of Babel, where we speak different languages and we only listen to those who share the same views with us. There are three major forces. There are three major forces that collectively bind together successful democracies. Social capital, and by that I mean uh, the extensive social networks with high levels of trust, so admired by Alexis Tocqueville, the Tocqueville when he visited the United States in the 1830s. Strong institutions and common stories, common stories that forge a unified national identity, all three are being threatened today. At the same time, authoritarian regimes are questioning our ability to deliver prosperity for all our citizens. They're offering their people a Faustian deal. You trade political freedom and individual rights for high levels of growth and individual economic well-being. Many, unfortunately, are willing to accept it. These are some of the challenges we face today. And that is why making our democracies more resilient is such an important priority 
for our generation. I wish I had the answers to all these complicated questions, but I think I know where to start. We need to strengthen our democratic institutions to address the root causes of the anger and distrust of our citizens. We need to tackle income inequalities without losing the dynamism of our open economies. We need to reform social media so that it becomes less socially corrosive. And we need to train our young people to seize the opportunities of democratic citizenship in this new age. And maybe a dive in our shared historical past would be of particular use. James Madison knew that democracies can be threatened by the turbulency and weakness of unruly passions. That is why insulating decision-making from the emotions of the moment while still holding democratic leaders accountable on election day was one of his major preoccupations. Madison was clearly inspired by Pericles, who knew that democracy had a dark side, that if left unrestrained, could lead to its downfall. So Thucydides had Pericles say of ancient Athens, we are a free democracy, but we obey our laws, more especially those who protect the weak and the unwritten laws whose transgression bring shame. Every time, every time we gaze in wonder at the Parthenon frieze, half of which unfortunately still sits in the British Museum rather than the Acropolis Museum where it belongs, we are reminded of the glory of a thriving democracy. <laughs> 30 years after the Parthenon was constructed, democracy in Athens was no more. Reinventing democracy to fit the challenges of the 21st century may sound like a tall order, but this is the mission of our generation, and I'm certain we will accomplish it. <laughs> Esteemed members of Congress, let me conclude by making a special reference to the one unshakable bond that will always bind our two countries together, the Greek-American community. It is a special moment to see so many of you here with us today. And over the past 120 years, your country has warmly welcomed, encouraged, and supported the waves of immigrants who came to the United States in search for a better life. Not to mention students like me, who spent seven years studying in American universities. Those who sailed to this country were not philosophers and poets like their noble ancestors. For the most part, they were simple laborers, and they eagerly took any work that they could. But no matter how uneducated the Greeks or how menial their work, they would typically apply themselves with great determination and embrace any chance to prosper in life and educate their children. They offered them a brighter future, fulfilling the solemn duty that every generation should be able to live a better life than the previous one. They experienced the American dream, but never forgot where they came from.
Today, the Greeks who live in the United States and the three million Americans who identify themselves as Greeks include some of the most respected leaders in the arts, science, education, medicine, the judiciary, and of course, politics. Modern visionaries like Nicolas Negroponte and Albert Bourla, John Cassavetes and Ilya Kazan, Jeffrey Evgenidis and George Pelecanos, Alexander Payne and Tom Hanks, and of course, Giannis Adetokounmpo. Six of them are in the Congress. One of them, my friend Mike Dukakis, ran for president of the United States. And I think one of the reasons Greeks were accepted in America so readily lies in the fact that the values of America and Greek values have so much in common. One of the qualities that Greeks value the most is sophrosyne a word best translated as self-control, temperance, and harmony. The ancient Greeks thought arrogance, extremism, and, ex and excess the worst threats to democracy. For man, Aristotle wrote, life according to reason is best and most pleasant since reason more than anything else is man. That reason, that reason tells me we Greeks and Americans have a lot more to contribute as custodians of democracy. That government of the people, by the people, for the people shall thrive again. And I bring you here today, I bring you here today the pledge of the Greek people that we stand together with the people of the United States whenever and wherever necessary to ensure that the hopes of our ancestors, our ancestors bequeathed to the world 25 centuries ago will endure. And the dream of freedom for every human being on this planet will never die. Long live the friendship between Greece and the United States of America. Efkaristo, thank you very much.
purpose of the joint meeting having been completed, the chair declares the joint meeting of the two houses now dissolved. The House will continue in recess subject to the call of the chair.